Hello, friends. My name is Steve, and we are here today for Cinephile Saturday, Episode 2. Yeah, it's been a long time since Episode 1, but we're back on track. And I'm here today with Dan from the Black and Blue Color Reader, and we'll be discussing Natural Born Killers, the 1994 Oliver Stone film that uh, I should have... We were just talking a second ago, but that I feel like I should have watched back in the 90s, but Dan... Yeah, yeah. I, I, when you said you didn't want, you you haven't watched this, I, I, I was floored. I'm like, I thought for sure that Steve, of all people, would have, would have seen this movie. It's right in my alley, too. I, I remember when it when it came out, and it's all, the, all, all during that whole time period, it's like, that's the type of movies I loved, like, like all the Tarantino stuff, like Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction. It just, it was... For whatever reason, I, and I love Oliver Stone, and for just whatever reason, I just didn't see it all these years. But yeah, so what's uh, what, what's your experience with it? What what uh, when did you first see it? Oh, I I saw this movie back in the '90s when it came out. You know, I think I was like early in my high school days, and it was a, it was a cult classic, man. And you know, that there's a lot of um, you know, rock and roll types. I mean, this is was a rock and roll type movie um, with you know just just all out violence and craziness. And Tarantino was involved in the movie, and you know anything that Tarantino touched, I was I was all over. Um, I believe uh, True Romance, and it, I just loved those excessively violent movies, but <laughs> that were different. That that were that were something new that weren't that wasn't you know that had great funny dialogue like like something you've never really heard of before and you know this was one of those movies that I, I really enjoyed uh, when I was a kid back at the turn of the century. You saying that you enjoyed this movie as a kid is a, a little bit troubling. I don't know. I gotta say it is, but you know, I, I was in my teens. Yeah. I, I believe I was fourteen, fifteen when when this movie came out, and uh, I remember it being uh, bloody and, and uh, you know graphic. And I just um, I remember it getting a lot of flack hmm. in in the media. Which you know was was funny because it was definitely throwing shots at the media uh, back then. Yeah, that's one thing that because I didn't know what to expect, and I I didn't know that Tarantino wrote the screenplay for this one at all. I had no idea until I saw the uh, beginning, the introduction, the the uh, you know kind of the credits in the beginning. But I was surprised because I I wasn't I didn't know it'd be so so satirical. Um, I didn't expect that kind of threw me off a little bit because I thought it was like a straightforward it was so, narrative. It, it seemed absurdist mm -hmm. at times, you know, like especially your parts with Robbie, Robert Downey Jr. Um, being the um, reporter who, who knows what we love. And, you know, that unfortunately that's still the case, you know, there are, you know, Game of Thrones, what you know did not become such a powerhouse hit if it didn't have all that sex and violence mm -hmm. in it, and you know, we as at least American society we eat that shit up yeah. left and right. To, you know, <laughs> if there's something going on outside our street, if we hear gunshots, we're sticking our heads out to to check it out. You know, it was, and I, I just loved how he did that through shots at. And if you if you were a kid in the '90s, this was the rise of those crime shows that that they made fun of within this movie, the dramatization, and it was you know somebody to, you know playing Mickey and Mallory. Like I watched those shows constantly on ID Channel. I believe they were on A and E back in the day, mm -hmm. you know. And we, you know, I remember that I was, you know, I, I drank the juice. I was definitely enthralled by, by re, you know, real stories of violence, and, and you know, and it, this movie really just, um, you know, this is I, I believe this is post Columbine. If I'm not mistaken, I think um, Columbine was at ninety seven. It is right around that that time, and it's it's crazy, you know, with the mass shootings going on, you know, just in in our society today, that this movie is still relevant. 
uh, to this day. It's a shame that it is. Mm. It's a, you know that it is, but it is. You know, we still have these issues of um, you know trying to be famous. You know, that was another uh, bit of a theme, and being famous. However, you were able to do it, whether it was violence or through other means. I think this this was during the time, like OJ, the OJ trial, and I'm, I'm sure you remember that whole thing. I mean, that's all the all the sensationalism, and I, I think it's holding a mirror back up on all of us. I mean, to some point. I mean, because we absorb that stuff. I mean, at some point. So I can see why the media wouldn't be too. Yeah, the Happy. people that love this movie for the reasons that I I stated earlier, the violence, the 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 sex, the the graphic nature, the the cursing, you know, it's basically it is making fun of its viewer. Mm-hmm. It's like you are you are the reason this is being a satire. Like we're making fun of you and you know, this is not that it was totally blatant. But it, it was definitely there that you, you know, and they had the, you know, they had this whole cult following. And we have plenty of people out there that love our, our um, you know, our serial killer documentaries. Mm-hmm. And I'm one of them, you know, and I, I am and, you know, and I know I shouldn't love it, but I, I can't help it sometimes, you know. Yeah, and, you know, I think the Night Stalker was around this time, too. I think he had like a, I think he had women you know, calling him and wanting to get, I think he got married. In yep. prison I think he was married in prison actually to, I think he, I don't know if he's still it, but I, I do remember hearing him being married. Ted Bundy was, was married. Um, you know, these, you know, they become icons and that's what this movie was, was, was stating is, you know, this whole, uh, spree shooting and Mickey and Mallory were, were, were sensationalized and, and the, the, that's why it was so graphic he was making a, a point you know that it was so over the top some scenes here you know at the end in, in the prison you know you're just walking through this prison and each person you walk by is being strangled or, or, or their throats are getting cut or they're being put in an oven and it, it's it, it was over the top for a purpose mm-hmm. um and i just I, I thought it was an excellent movie um and I, I just you know i i it still hit me today when i watch it again even after you know i've seen the movie uh, probably four or five times in my life even even that many times I don't know is enough to get all the little details in it because even like in yep. the in the bedroom scenes with Mickey and Mallory when they even when they have the hostage in the room there's like nature nature shows on the walls and um, yeah. all the different all the different kind of film stock that they use and the black and white for the flashbacks and all like it's really it's the way that it's edited makes you feel uncomfortable in a way because it it's really abrupt like everything it's it like flashes of things. It's like supposed to keep you off kilter. It seems like. Yeah. But I, I think it's also supposed to throw you cause it's throwing it in your face. Like mm. I believe that, you know, the, the title of this natural born killers, you know, there's a lot of things that we can take out of that nature versus nurture. Mm. Um, are humans inherently violent? Um, is that our nature or, and will we continue to, to, you know, crave this, you know, or, you know, embrace our violent nature to get ahead. And with the flashes that you've seen are, you know, um, examples of when violence kind of wins out. Um, and it's something, you know, even, you know, a recent book I've read, Blood Meridian, this is a, a total theme of, of, you know, whether this is human nature or whether this is something that we can control and it, you know, and hold back, or, or are we going to continue to be violent, um, you know, throughout our, our, our time on this planet? Are we going to continue to subjugate the, the weaker of, of the people? Um, yeah, there's just so much to be said about this movie and, and, and the statements that it was making. One of the things that I think were the most the, it's probably the scenes I like the most, but they're the most I, for me. It was the most 
I don't know, kind of the most disturbing, I guess, were the sitcom scenes. That, I love that because all right, I um, I was guessing it was a play on it was the the, the racist like Archie uh, Bunker, uh, All in the Family. Ar- that's yeah. yes, yeah, Archie Bunker, and it, and when you looked at that, they were laughing at some horrible things. The crowd was laughing at like sexual, you know, ch- you know pedophilia and, and and all these things and and misogyny and and you know domestic violence and it was just all grazed over and laughed over it was i love that how the structure of this whole movie was was absolutely bonkers you know because we are thrown into that sitcom and then we are thrown into drug fuel rages and, and i just love how it was edited and done um, with, you know, they're driving a car, but you can tell that you're, the scene in front of you is not what they're driving down. It's like a weird, you know, flashing desert land and they're getting crazy in the car. I just love the, the different taste. And you can see, you know, I could just gush about it, I guess, um, with, with the cartoon at the animation added into it was another thing. It was, he played with a lot of things within this uh, within this movie, and I thought they they all were done quite successfully. Though the the absurdity, you know, the the, the blatant, you know, um, things kind of droned on you, like, oh my God, is 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 Robert Downey Jr. really going to join them and start sh- killing everybody? You know, that was. Um, you know, overdone in my opinion, hmm. but it, it, you know, it still worked. It, it, you know, it was kind of absurd, but you know, back then, that's you know, that's a rep- that was a reporter's dream to to you know cover something uh, of that magnitude. Yeah, like the as, as over the top as he was, and everyone everyone is a little over the top. I mean, everyone's uh, you know, everyone's a, a little bit uh, you know like, like an exaggeration of what they are. Yes. Um, but yeah, Robert Downey Jr.'s character was because, like you said, he's it's his dream to interview them, and he he almost encourages because he wants it to be this you know post Super Bowl. He wants it to have all the eyeballs on it, and he wants to be famous. And he's he's also trying to become more famous you know, than he already was. So they're all seeking. That's fame. funny how they threw that in with the Super Bowl, mm-hmm. the most watched American event. In, in, in all this all the country and that that's this is after it so we go from watching a violent game hmm. you know to to watching this you know nobody's going to click off because you know we that's our nature we want to see more and and you know that it rolls right after the football game i just was another you know these are little things that he just you know puts in here that just work so well hmm. That was interesting. I didn't think about that, about the Super Bowl being a, you know, it's of like a violent sport. Yeah, and they had the, so it's, it, it, it was throwing, you know, um, it, it was kind of saying that, you know, Americans, we want, we are too engrossed in, in television. And you could see it, it flash across, I think, Mickey and Mallory at the end. We watch too much TV. It was that, like, in your face some at, to the point where like you know what like i get it oliver stone we're not stupid like you can calm down on some of this <laughs> but yeah with the you know the, it had a lot to say about us as, as as a society you know i think and i really enjoy movies like that you know kind of like uh crash is and if, if you've never seen crash that is an exceptional uh movie in my opinion the um the one with James Spader or the other one? The Matt Dillon it one. It had Brendan Fraser. It had uh, Sandra Bullock. Mm. It, it, I think it won an Oscar. It, it had a lot to do with um, uh, race oh. and, and gender. Um, and it was just exceptional. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've seen that one. It's been a while. But yeah, Don Cheadle, Sandra Bullock. Thandy Newton. Yeah, Don. Yep, Don. Ju- there's so many like I'm thinking like movies like that made these background actors so much more. You know, we're talking Sandra Bullock and 
and and Brendan Fraser, Don Scheel. Um, I'm sure I can't remember any more of them, but um, you know, the movie like that really kind of made some of these actors, brought them back in the spotlight and things like that. There's it's such a good movie. There's and there's also a lot of references to the American kind of. It's also a. It also plays. It's, it's also plays satire about you know our society and media and us consuming the media, but also about the American kind of the things we're obsessed with. Um, you know, Obsession, like the yes. the open road and um, guns and you know all these things that we are obsessed with, and it yep. you know it's so he, he does freedom freedom right yeah how about that they they did speak about you know i i'll kill you and you'll be free or you know freedom from from this life to move into a next one they they you know they talked about their uh, ideologies as well and a lot of it having to do with freedom and that yes definitely could be tied into american society um you know, anarchy, not being told what to do, uh, very libertarian type uh, outlook. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the um, the another thing that really well, because I hadn't seen the movie, but I had li- I had listened to the soundtrack at how many times. Um, so the the soundtrack I thought was very of the time, but I think they did a good job of when to insert certain music and when not to. Yeah, so there was some Mazzy Star. I remember that because I was a big, um, not a huge Mazzy Star fan, but there was Sweet Jane. Mm-hmm. It was in that. Um, I'm trying to see uh, Leonard what, Cohen. What was actually on the soundtrack <laughs> also. A lot of Leonard Cohen. There was also, um, uh, what yeah, else? I remember Everybody Knows by Leonard Cohen. But that, that's another movie. I think I asked you to check the other movie with Leonard Cohen in it, but let me see. Uh, I was looking for the songs on it, but I, I can't really find them right now. Oh, here we go. Uh, yep, Leonard mm-hmm. uh, waiting for a miracle. Lou Reed, uh, Trent Reznor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He, I think he and compiled they, they, you it. Know, we also had, you know, they, they were eating mushrooms mm-hmm. and, and, and tripping their ass off, so there has to be some sort of 60s acid rock in there somewhere um can't really uh there's jane's addiction Mm -hmm. i think is on in there as well oh sweet jane they're saying it's the junkie cowboys Mm -hmm. i I thought they were i thought it was mad i'm pretty sure mazzy star did a uh, sweet jane kenny lane and patty smith a uh, lot of very uh, Peter Gabriel, the um, Bob Dylan. Yeah. Oh yeah, Bob Dylan. I think they're even saying that Dr. Dre is in in mm-hmm. some. It has a song in there as well. Yeah, he did. <laughs> That's uh, great. Snoop Dogg and um, the Dark Pound. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I thought that was all done uh, pretty well too. It is. For, and I've also read that Oliver Stone is tripping out of his mind when he made a lot when he was putting this together. I can can I I can totally see that because the, every cut is kind of cartoonish in a way where I was saying at least with Robert Downey Jr. you know it's so over the top. Even with Tommy Lee Jones being the um. Uh, the warden mm-hmm. in that he was so over the top and you know and it was it was very you know psychedelic in nature if you really and the you know they would say a sentence and then they would, re- they would repeat it in a different color you know like a, a black and white color of them and it was i just i love that i mean i could not get enough of the the, the trippy nature of the of the directing and the shooting. What did you think about Tom Sizemore? He's the detective. Uh, let me grab his name. Right. He, when I saw him, I'm like, you know what? I, I know he, Tarantino was a big fan hmm. of Sizemore, right? And is in a bunch of uh, Tarantino movies. Uh, I was, that's where the obsession, like in America's obsession with things, the, the, the murderers, the, the drugs, 
the sets and that's it didn't us even when we find somebody who was supposed to be the good guy right he's supposed to be the cop in this the good guy that's going to save people you know from mickey and mallory he turns out to be just as evil as the rest of them and i think i love that part it definitely says a lot um you know you could definitely get into a lot about that i kind of wondered if if the well it's jack skagnetti and he has his own book he's also uh you know carving out his own little corner for fame and attention but i wondered is is the commentary there that that you'd need to be a monster to hunt monsters i that's uh, yeah i think that's an excellent idea you know i think you know that these are you know themes that were addressed in in some other movies i'm not sure if i'm trying to think of another movie that had that to you know that the people that are being you to, to, like like you said to be a monster you know to hunt a monster you need to become a monster and I, you know, I, I, these murderers, obviously, they, they think differently. You know, they don't think like, like you or I. Um, and to get into somebody's head like that, um, I'm not sure if Silence of the Lambs, you know, they were, you know, the, our protagonist was trying to get into head of another serial killer to catch one serial killer. So that that's another movie that kind of did that, that that you need to, um, you know, dive deep in, in, into the darkness in order to, you know, chase somebody, of, you know, of that, you know, mindset. Mm-hmm. And of course, at the center of this whole thing is this relationship with, uh, <laughs> with Mickey and Mallory and their yeah, uh, greatest love story yeah. ever told, <laughs> you know, I mean, Hey, how about that? They get away at the end, and they're living in a in in a, in a van with their kids. <laughs> you know this that is the this is the greatest love story ever. The, you know, guys, go watch this movie. No need to watch Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> you know this this is where it's at. <laughs> well, I wondered if is that was that the ending, or is that what they what they kind of had in their minds that they would end up being eventually was i thought that was the ending they they walked off he <laughs> that that part where mickey tells robert downey jr that there's no helicopters coming from you you are not important yeah. they don't care about you and he walks off i just thought that was hysterical and he walks off and you know you do see flashes of them now living a happy family basically somebody who has watched and and watched all this violence you know at the end they're saying you you still you you did all this you've witnessed all this yet you can still be a normal person Hmm. and that you know that is just your 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 obsession or, or you know that was something that can be put away um and become a a normal human being you know, with a family and things like that. I think that, that, that also said a, a lot. And they do have some self-control cause they do always leave a survivor. So they did have, cause they had a plan. It wasn't just murder for murder's sake, I guess in a, in a, in a sense it was, but they also wanted the attention. They wanted someone to tell the story. So this was definitely, I'm not sure if uh, you've read, um, Blood Meridian, but it's it's very it has a lot of parallels. Hmm. The stories have a lot of parallels to them, at least in, in what the judge was saying about human nature. And also, you know, we you know we didn't even kind of touch on this. This is natural born killers. Like there's that total nature versus nurture, and and, and you know, are we born inherently evil or is it? A product of our upbringing, um, but both of these um, characters had had some really horrible upbringing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the those scenes were, I think, probably the most, I don't know, see, disturbing or the the they were the most moving scenes of what their childhoods and 
kind of what they had both gone through and, and how that affected them through the rest of the, the rest of their lives. Because that's always, when it comes to serial killers, the reason we are so fascinated because we can't understand it, right? We are always asking, and, and, and our you know fascination is to why did they do this? How could they do this? And when you are given, it's not really answers, but you are given not just not justifications, but why they they can bring themselves to murder somebody and act this way it's because they have been i would say there are a lot of um serial killers that have had had rough upbringings um you mentioned the night stalker Hmm. um bundy you know i think was told his mother was his sister and was raised by the grandparent or something like that um Dennis Rader, though, I think he was okay growing up. Um, that's BTK. I don't think there was much in his background, but there, the Green River Killer w- was abused by his mother as a child, you know, sexually abused by his mother as a child. So these are all the things that we want, and we want to know why. And, of course, you know, like always within the movie, you are presented, provided with some of the background some of the context of why these two are doing what they are doing Hmm. so does that play like you mentioned the title about natural born killers does that play with the title of kind of they went through this but they still chose so yeah with natural born killers i i don't so i i think it had more it, it was the question you know at the end he does say he's like because i'm a natural born killer um, but I don't think that's the, you know, in, in, this is the argument that has been going on for centuries, I believe, you know, is it heredity, mm-hmm. um, or, or is it, you know, the atmosphere you're raised in, or is it a combination of both? And I believe, at least for me, it's a combination of both. Um, yes, you, some people can't, are just born evil. Um, and you can't find anything in their background to suggest why they would do such things. Um, and then some people, you can definitely find pinpoint thing, you know, pinpoint areas where, you know, they were abused, and this is how they they coped with it, or or this is how you know why they lashed out. But you know, it's 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 an ongoing argument that I don't think will ever be, um, you know, rectified. Um, because, like I said, we do find, you know, killers that are, you know, that had a wonderful childhood. And nobody can understand, you know, why they do the things they did. Mm-hmm. The the performances I felt like were all. I wondered if if, if everyone was in on what this was going to be because when you read the script, without knowing how it was going to be edited, I wondered how that filming went or how you know. Kind of, is this what they yeah. all expected to? It's kind of swashbuckling, you know, like these, like Tommy Lee and um, Juliet Lewis, that's who it was, mm-hmm. right? Juliet Lewis and um, Robert Downey Jr. Like their acting was flamboyant, it was very loud um, to get their point across. You know, I, I believe that the, the, director was like this is what i'm looking for i want you to smack people in the face with with what i'm trying to get across rather than making it subtle Mm -hmm. um because if he wanted to make a subtle movie it would not have been this violent (laughs) you know and you could make a very you know a good subtle movie but i i believe the violence definitely had a purpose uh within this within this movie Mm -hmm. yeah the you mentioned too about the sensationalism and I think, you know, there was like Halloween costumes of Mickey and Mallory and I think they were interviewing kids and they said, well, we don't, you know, we don't, th- we don't think it's right that, you know, murderers are wrong and all, but we love Mickey and Mallory kind of like, yeah. it's, you know, we think it's wrong, but we still love them because they're rock stars. You know, they're larger than life. 
And that's the way it is today, or at least back then. I mean, these were sensationalized events. I mean, when you think back, the Menendez brothers, mm. you know, the... Um, um, the guy who was beaten, uh, Rodney King, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and it, it keeps going on and on to even how over sensationalized or over um, publicized the recent killings of the the two. There, there was a man and woman that were in a. a there were these two kids missing from a long time. It was about six, eight, maybe a year and a half. There were kids missing, and they had the mother, and she she took off with her husband to Hawaii, and they picked her up, and and they brought her back, and she was part of a cult. I forget her name, but you know we, I'm not even into the news. But when I heard about this story, how crazy it was, I actually tuned in, and it's sad, but. You know, that's, you know, that's what, you know, what we want to see. I think it even takes us back to like the Colosseum, like the Roman, because we, yeah. you know, it's kind of like we have, we always, is that just part of our nature? Is that we crave those things that we, we've always been, you know, like tabloids and violence and have we, is that just our nature? Or is that something else at play? I, you know, I believe it's, it's in there. I believe it deep down, this is something, you know, I have a, so this is in, in our nature, right? So I have a dog and <laughs> not, not the little guy, oh, okay. not the little guy, the other guy, Jackson Brown, right? So when I'm sleeping on my bed, you know, these are domesticated animals for centuries and centuries and centuries, right? My dog has never met another um, hound or what is he, uh, an Australian, he's some sort of hound, right? And when I'm in my bed, my dog will jump up onto my bed and like hip check me to sleep on my back. Like I'm laying down and he will sleep on my back. And that's how they did it when they were, um, you know, when they were groups with that, that were not, um, brought into homes they were you know they, they sat back to back so they could watch each other's back and if you look it up you'll ask you know why is my dog stay laying on the on my back and it has to sleep right on my back mm. and face the other way and you'll see that that's it's within their blood it's with it's with it's a heredit a hereditary thing that has been developed for centuries and centuries and centuries before these animals even became domesticated uh, that they will sleep back to back to watch each other's, you know, area. And each person, each dog would sleep kind of in a circle to keep watch on the outside. And my dog's never, it's its just in his blood. It's his nature to be a protector, to, to you know, position himself like that to watch my back while I sleep. Um, and that could be said about humans. Uh, is, is it in our nature to be violent? You know, what has violence gotten us? It, it's been shown as a tool to get us things for, you know, centuries and centuries and centuries. And it, I don't think it's going to, it's, it's slowly going. It's not good. You know, it's, it's, you can see, but is it going to stick, you know, all across humanity right now? Or are we at, at a spot where we might be less violent? Maybe. But I mean, let's look over there at Russia and and uh, the Ukraine, like this is something uh, that is ingrained in us, and you know, we're trying to make it better. I think as a society, for the most part, but I don't think it's something that's just going to disappear completely, because we subjugate everything that we come in contact with, yeah. like the dog that I just talked about. You know, we domesticated him, and you know, and we domestic, you know, we. Um, conquer most things that we come in contact with. Yeah, the um, well, I think even thinking back to the pandemic, you know, we kind of saw how fast things can just turn. You know, so now yes. even, you know, we're all we we behave for the most part, but if the lights went out, 
and we had no, I mean, like no electricity, no sign of when it might come back. How long before things just took a turn? <laughs> so the pandemic, that's, you're right. So in the pandemic, I mean, ha- the gun sales went up astronomically. And me, being a passive hippie that I am, <laughs> you know, I was like watching there are gun shops. You know, I live outside Philadelphia. So there are gun shops, you know, Walmarts with gun shops and gun shops near me. And the lines are out the door. And I'm over here like, what if I got nothing? I don't have something in my house to protect me, God forbid. So automatically, I'm like, I went to my wife. I'm like, you know, should I should I buy a gun? And she's like, no, you're, you know. You're over exaggerating. I'm like, yeah, but everyone else that's over exaggerating has guns. <laughs> like, what am I gonna do if really shit does hit the fan? And I'm not gonna be prepared. Um, but obviously, you know, I was just like, I'm, I'm too smart right now to buy a gun. I mean, when when if if I'm without you know power and electricity for a month, then I think it's time to start looking into uh, into my arsenal. Um, but yeah, it was, it will happen. That was a lot of people's first thought. Mm-hmm. You know, this is a pandemic. We're running out of fucking toilet paper. My ass is itching. I might as well go get a gun, you know? <laughs> and, you know, people were <laughs> sick. And, and the other people that, that weren't as sick as that, I you damn better believe when they see all the people lining up for bullets and they're like, you know what? I've never shot a gun in my life. I don't like the damn things. I'm very, you know, um, I'm such a hippie. And, you know, all of a sudden that hippie leaves and like, you need to protect yourself if God forbid something goes down. And, um, you know, it was, you know, you start thinking back to survival, mm-hmm. right? That's, that's what, that's what we have that. That's going to be ingrained into us forever matter what we're gonna we need to survive you know whatever we need to do to survive that's going to get done um so i don't think that nature will ever totally leave us you know that feeling yeah the you know i also wonder too like if this movie was made today i wonder how different it would be because then it was all the the satire was based at a lot of the news coverage and sitcoms and um of course, like their the child does and things too. But as far as the media part goes, it was more about the the newscaster and the major news networks because they controlled every they had they controlled everything then. But now you can turn you can watch YouTube and you can get a thousand different uh, opinions from any, any anyone. So now would it be a social media thing? Would it be like a the TikTok killers or something? <laughs> what would it? How different would it be now? I don't think it would be that much more different. I- think the the themes are still apparent today um you know i brought up the mass shootings that that have consistently been going on and and you know kids that that are you know and and gun control issues that we have today of course it would have to be made a different style um you know you get on youtube and they're you know there, there's some dress, you know, I see, you know, uh, cartel videos on YouTube with millions and millions of views of somebody about to get his head chopped off. Um, and this is, doesn't stop, you know, now that the medium has changed, um, I don't think the obsessions or the, um, you know, the, the, the need to be famous, I still think that is still apparent, even with YouTube being, you know, what I consistently watch most. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I still think these are very, um, these topics are still apparent today, and, and, and it'll st- it would still work, but I believe it would have to be kind of a different style in order to be such a, a, a hit movie, in my opinion. Yeah, I do wonder with, it seems like the younger generations now are, they're shying away from from the violent. I don't know, but I mean, I think they. It seems like the younger generations now are obsessed more with celebrities and like 
uh, entertainment. Like, right. Yeah. I do. I believe that you're correct about that. Like, I have you know a a child that watches YouTube and the the personalities we find on YouTube and how much money he's enamored with how successful he is, how how famous he is. And yes, you're right. Like people get on YouTube to try to get that one view that'll get them millions and millions, and and you know they they keep going with you know whatever it is that got them there. But you know, I, it's popularity. You know, being famous and recognized. It's I think you're right. I think many of the kids, you know, follow these guys on, on social media. Um, because you know that you know they they have a connection with this per- if the, that person might comment like our stars back in the day it was like wow you know I'm I'm at a baseball game and this guy's going to sign my ball no like these guys can comment on an on an on a YouTube post and then you're like oh you're starstruck yeah. you know and and you know that person could reach out to you you have more access mm-hmm. to many of these um, famous people these days, I believe. Is that a good thing, just in general, you think, to have more access? I don't think so. Yeah. I, don't think so. I mean, my unfortunately, my uh, 10-year-old, he is enamored with Jake Paul. Hmm. And I have to, he likes him so much that I kind of can't say anything bad about him. Um, so I just kind of, like, be nice about it. But I, I you know, I just... I don't like how how they act and things like that. And my kid looks up to that, you know, and it's um, unfortunate. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, and and now I think another thing with with gun, with guns and gun control, it, it's it's interesting because Hollywood often rails against guns and violence, but they sensationalize it all yeah, the time. So the same people. It's just you know. what this movie was doing. It, it was telling you that this is crazy. <clears throat> That you know that this is being sensationalized, and you can't, and you still can't get enough of it. Like I said, it was, it was stating you as the viewer are you know are are causing this, and we still didn't look away from the movie. You know, we still went through it because we <laughs> enjoyed it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, it is. It it does seem like it's almost like making fun of you at the same time. Like it's, it's supposed to be uncomfortable. Um, you're supposed to feel called out a little bit. For sure. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I wasn't sure what to think about it at first. I, I, I wasn't what I was, what I was expecting. So I was just a little bit like, this isn't what I thought it would be, but the more I thought about it, the more I like it. Um, so where, where do you stand with this one? I, I know you've seen it a bunch of times and you've liked it for a long time, but. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say it's one of my favorite movies of all time, but I, I would put it in there with like, you know, I, I like every Tarantino movie. Other than, you know, I, got, I think I should watch Jackie Brown again because uh, I wasn't the biggest fan of that one when, when I watched it. Uh, but I, I put that in those that category, that Tarantino category of ultra-violent, excellent dialogue and, and excellent character work. Um, and that's the stuff that I love. I can't really, um, you know, it's definitely on my, I would say my top 50, I would probably put natural born killers. Cause I love the, um, you know, the themes that it does, um, address in here, but the whole over the top way it was done. Definitely. It was a bit of a negative. I hmm. loved it. I liked how it was done, but I didn't like that. You know, it was kind of really thrown in your face uh rather than subtle yeah but you know when we think of a movie from beginning to end you know it was i watched the whole thing still you know i knew what happened and i was still like wow this was a great movie for its time it also has a bit of a like especially in the scenes like you mentioned when they're in the car and there's a the other screens playing and there's like you know where they're driving to and has that really? It almost sounds like a, a '60s grindhouse, you know, uh, yes. like drive-in theater kind of uh, feeling to it too. Yeah, and I I really like this that style of how it was done because you know 
that is not that that's breaking a mold and i love when movies do that memento just Mm -hmm. go backwards the whole way like i love something that that takes your typical hollywood structure and just rearranges it and you know tarantino did that you know with this is very he, he you know changed the game and the way things are set up and 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 laid out to the viewer i i really love when when somebody is doing something new um and you know i also love when it's you know the same old you know hollywood procedure you know you 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 get the beginning your middle and your end but um i i just like the the shots that were taken um and the the artistic way that he did this movie because he definitely stepped out of the mold you know with you know it was very it was very trippy um a lot of, it was very it had a lot of you know a- acid references to it um you know, the guy, his face would twist up on the mushrooms. That's like a flashback. And it was, um, I just love the way it was done. That You know, with, it had uh, black and white. It had color. It had off, you know, two people stand with a green screen of something completely different. Um, and it, was, it just really brought you into this crazy mind of of two killers and and you know their you know their view of the, of what is going on during this tumultuous time you know that they're out there killing people yeah also too when when uh mickey's escaping the prison yard or he's on the horse and it 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 does give you uh kind of thinking back to westerns and this like this like larger than life and he's it's almost like he's a hero and he's he's getting extra help because it's he's some kind of like otherworldly character so it it does play a lot with that kind of stuff too yeah he was playing himself Hmm. as the anti-hero at the end during the um interview he's like i have evolved you guys are peons you know i have evolved into a killer which is you know what we are supposed to evolve into was was his basic um you know outlook but yeah he was seen as the hero and you know what he got away and 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 lived happily ever after at the end of the movie yeah. so <laughs> you know take that tropes yeah you know what i mean you, your bad guy wins and i love that shit yeah you know i love it when when you know I didn't, you know, I really think, obviously, I believe he should be locked up and, and, you know, for the rest of his life. But it was interesting to see a movie that didn't, you know, follow the same old Hollywood bullshit that we keep seeing time and time again. I don't know. I know we talked about what this this movie would be like today if it was made today. I don't know if that it would be made today. I, I think you're correct about that. Um yeah, I mean, unfortunately, you know, with I'm trying to think of the last movie that was ultra violent that came out in the theater. Uh, that was a big hit, uh, but I, and I can't really think of that. I believe that we, you know, in the midst of cancel culture and, and things like that, I believe you're right. This movie and, and the producers would never. Um, back this type of movie today. And that's unfortunate because I believe it, it says a lot about who we are and our society. Um, but yeah, I don't think it might be able to, it depends, you know, because we are the ones who are buying the movie tickets, you know, we're, but we're not buying them for our kids. Um, but I think it, it could possibly get done today but they would definitely have to cut a whole shit ton out yeah i mean uh, i mean because we do not have a good female protagonist in this she is um abused she's she's you know uh mallory i i think you know is also so su- was suffering from some um that syndrome where your captor I forget oh, like stockholm called. syndrome stockholm Right, she's surrounded by this man, this powerful presence, and um, 
I don't think she was, you know, the best of female characters, but she was a badass. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the um, also even movies like John Wick, though. I mean, they're ultra violent too. But I, it's, I think without Keanu Reeves, I'm not sure that that series would have made it very far. I think that's more that that flashy violence, which with Keanu Reeves, and when we're talking about a movie like this, this is more horror esque in in certain aspects. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think your your regular action movies, like like John Wick and stuff, are still pretty violent. But I don't; they did not really scratch the surface of, of this type of violence. Yeah. It is, it is yes, shoot them up, bang. But we are not getting a whole picture of the guy's face when he when he gets shot in the head. You know, it's not that gory. Uh, we're natural born killers. It, it definitely went over the top. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, the the very beginning of the diner was a perfect introduction to them, I think, and their uh, kind of like what they did and kind of characters they were. So it's a good introduction. Yeah, I, I love. Yeah, I, I. That's one of the parts of that movie that I remember. It was her just flipping out, just like "Come here, fucker! Yeah, you want to dance?" <laughs> like that was just she just. I remember her acting, and I still remember that scene to this day, even at, before I watched it again. Um, I do, I do remember that scene. I really love the, you know, I love that in um, Kill Bill, the animation that came in. It wasn't the best, but uh, I love that part in Kill Bill when when that animation and you know entered. Um, I, I wish more people did something like that. Mm-hmm. You know, more directors, you know, just take chances, go, go out there and see what you can do. You know, Tarantino isn't, isn't so popular because he, he stuck to the mold, you know, he went out there and, and just, you know, reinvented, uh, at least for me, reinvented what good, you know, good, good movies should be. Mm. In my opinion. Do you have a favorite scene in this one? In this one, yeah, it's probably that beginning scene. Mm-hmm. Like that was great, where you know she's just minding her business, and in come these you know redneck assholes, and she just slices them up. I mean, uh, Mickey cut that dude's finger off, and it fell in his shoe, and he kicks it away. I was like, that that's great. I mean, there are some excellent scenes in here. And I I love it when Robert Downey Jr. gets blown away. Mm-hmm. Um, there, you know, I, I love that, you know, going into that that scene where it was like a sitcom, mm-hmm. and you got your your typical family, which was, you know, what you've seen in every sitcom, you know, the perfect family with the husband, the wife, the the boy and the girl, and he's the boy's in like uh, a kiss makeup and stuff and. You know, she's in some crazy outfit and she has braces on. It's just, there's, there are a lot of great scenes in this movie um, that I won't forget for a long, long time to come. I wonder what, how different it would have been if Tarantino directed it or if he would direct it now, like did his interpretation of it. I wonder how different it would be. I, I thought it was very Tarantino esque, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, because when, he would have probably chopped it up and made different storylines at different times because he does. I think the dialogue would have been a lot better. Mm. Not that I didn't like it in here, but I think, you know, he could have definitely added a little more and maybe not made it as uh, so loud and flamboyant and, and just made it more believable. I think when, when we got to Tommy Lee Jones and, you know, the, who was the warden and the reporter, um, Robert Downey Jr., it seemed that their acting was just so over the top. And uh, it it bothered me just a little bit. Mm. And I think Tarantino probably could have made the dialogue flow a little better that it didn't need to do that. Um, 
but yeah, I just uh, I can't wait for my next Tarantino movie. Uh, I I don't know when it's coming out. <laughs> Favorite uh, Tarantino movie? Yeah, mine. Yeah. Oh, uh, it's, it's it's gonna be Pulp Fiction all, all the way. I need to watch Once Upon a Time again uh, because I heard. I didn't like that as much, and but somebody said it's better on a rewatch, so I was going to give it a shot again. How about yours? Uh, if I had to choose, probably Reservoir Dogs. Just it might be because okay. of just the this the because when I because back in the '90s, you you know when this when this was all happening, it was like whoa, like this is way this is just something totally different, and it it really like you know, reinvigorated my interest in movies and, and yeah. kind of like, it was a whole mm-hmm. new thing. It was really neat. And it, it was, it's very like for reservoir dogs is very contained and very, um, you know, all the characters are, you're, you're invested and you're, you're trying to figure out what's happening and you get the pieces here and there. But yeah, I just, I just love reservoir dogs. Pulp fiction, of course, can't go bad, wrong, but yeah, our bad guys are intelligent. Mm-hmm. In, in reservoirs, that was the big thing because when you listen to them talk, you're like, these guys have more than just being a bad guy. You know, even with Pulp Fiction, like, you know, what's a it's a Royale with cheese. <laughs> like, you we're, we're oh, they don't mess with the metric system out there in Amsterdam. Like, these were conversations that weren't your run of the mill, just stupid bad guys talking. These were interesting things they were saying. And uh, I love how how Tarantino c- can do that. And, you know, when uh, Miss, they, they had that whole discussion at the table about what... Um, the colors. <laughs> you no, know, what oh. Like a Virgin was about or what what Madonna song oh, was about. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it was and it was just like, just, just amazing dialogue that, that gave you... You know, such amazing characters, and, and that, that that were intelligent and and, and funny, and it, it just every most of his movies, I just really, I really love. Hmm. So, who, if someone hasn't seen Natural Born Killers, who would you recommend it to? Who should watch it? Oh, anybody that watches Grim Dark or that reads Grim Dark fantasy, um, even people that might have liked Blood Meridian. Hmm. Uh, I think that they they have a lot of parallels in in my opinion. Uh, and let you know, let's just remember this is a '90s movie, you know, and it's not, you know, it's not as polished as some of the things we see today. But it, it, it's excellent, and it, I think everybody should should definitely watch it and, and discuss it. Yeah, it's a good one. I don't know why it took me it took me so long. It, it took you to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I told you. I'm like, you got to get in on this, man. I, I was shocked because that that was definitely one of those movies that was a staple. You know, if I if I bought a DVD, which I used to have DVDs, you know, that I collected back in the day of movies that I loved. Uh, Natural Born Killers was on it. You know, a lot of you know, it, it definitely made the shelf. Mm-hmm. If I had fifty, it would make the shelf for sure. Nice. Well, cool. Well, thanks uh, for Is there anything else you can think of about Natural Born Killers? No, no. Go out and watch it. If you guys haven't done it, come on. It's uh, Woody Harrelson yeah. in his prime. You know, one of my favorite actors. And, and he's, he's, he's withstood the test of time still. You know, he's he's still getting pretty good roles. Oh, yeah. Still doing pretty good stuff. I think, I'm think i not sure how he ages, but he doesn't look... No, he looks, he looks the good. same in, in this and as as he does in and I think this was his breakout from being a Cheers guy. Oh yeah. Um, if I'm not mistaken, you know, going from being a dumb bartender in Cheers <laughs> to I think this being one of his first movies, you know, that that really put him on the map for um, you know um, directors looking to make movies and and films. Yeah, that was good stuff. Yeah, I'm glad you uh, encouraged me to finally watch it. It was worth it. Glad you yeah. did, man. Good stuff. Well, I appreciate you coming by. I know you're busy, so thanks for making time. Oh, it's my pleasure. I have to do it again soon. I if I wasn't if it if you weren't uh, if I wasn't such an old man, I would join you tonight for. Um, oh, Mirror's Truth. Yeah, I'm. I'm 
literally in the middle of it. Oh, nice. Yeah, I think we're actually, uh, you're doing one through 14? Uh, one through seven tonight. And then we're doing. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, the night I think I'm at that that part. Yeah. I, I would definitely join you, but, you know, it's getting like, old. Yeah. It's good. That is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's good. bedtime it's good around late. 10 o'clock. All these West Coast people are like, I need to do it late. Yeah, it's good. It's late. It's no problem. Yeah. Maybe I'll uh, maybe I'll join you at the end. Did um, I got I got an arc for his last book, so I, I need to finish that up and then read this one. And I want to put a, a review of his last book out on the day it releases, so that people can hopefully see it and go check out that series because I, I really enjoy it. Yeah, and we're we're talking about Manifest Delusions by Michael R. Fletcher. So, mm-hmm. yes. yeah, we're trying to we're trying to time it just right. So. Hopefully it'll work out. Good deal. We'll Good deal. But yeah, you can join us anytime whenever you feel like staying up late. Yeah, I will do yeah. that. If um, I like to think I'm still a rock star. Yeah. I'm, I'm in bed by 930. Yes. So maybe one day I can relive my uh, mm-hmm. my glory days yeah. and stay up till 10 and talk to you guys about uh, Mirror's Truth <laughs> and uh, the Manifest Delusion series. Nice. Yeah, we'll plan something fun. Right. Uh, for anyone who wants to uh, get in touch with you, where's the best best place to find you? Best place to find me is on uh, YouTube. Uh, I'm the Black and Blue Collar Reader, um, and I uh, review adult and dark fantasy, and uh, you know I review whatever I want. Actually, I'm getting into manga, I'm getting into historical fiction and and um, classics. So, you know, just. Hit me up on YouTube. Come along for the ride. Nice. And those links will be down below. So go check out Dan's stuff. Good stuff. Well, thanks again, Dan. Thanks for coming by. Hey, thanks for having me, Steve. I appreciate it. Anytime. We'll talk to you. We'll uh, do it again soon. Definitely.